Hello, Giants fans, and welcome to Valentine's Views here on the Big Blue View YouTube channel. In the lead up to the 2024 NFL draft, you guys know I've been uh, talking to a variety of NFL draft analysts, and today I'm thrilled to be joined by one of the best in the business, Trevor Sikkim, a lead draft analyst for Pro Football Focus, co-host of the NFL Stock Exchange. Trevor, thank you so much for, for a few minutes. And I appreciate you having me on the show. Excited to uh, talk a little Giants ball with you here. Yeah, you, you guys you guys have nothing to do with this time of year. Oh, no. Yeah, yeah. Wide open. <laughs> wide open. I mean, this is, this is, I'm going back to bed after this, you know? Oh, God. Don't we all wish? Don't we all wish? Ah, uh, hey, I, I saw... We'll we'll just dive right into it here. I saw an appearance that you made the other day on the Rich Eisen show, and you said that you felt like the Giants were, the word you used is desperate to move up and get a quarterback. And I, I thought right away that I had to I had to ask you about that. I, I think the Giants might want to do that. Um, but what why would you use the word desperate? So I would use the word desperate with the Giants just because I, I think that they were already a little on the fence with Daniel Jones, right? I mean, I think the extension took a little bit. Um, is he this guy who's going to be worth this second contract for you? Uh, you've seen some of the highs, but the consistency just has not been there at a level that you need it to be to really compete for the division at the top. Yeah, and obviously win a Super Bowl, which is the ultimate goal for this team. They end up, they end up giving him the extension, and I think pretty soon after that they regretted it. Right? I mean, just just again, the up and down play remained. You have the injury now that he is coming back from. You're going to have the flexibility to get out of that contract. And, and and I just look at this situation, and a year from now they could be in a somewhat similar situation where they're picking high if. Jones doesn't play well, and you are looking at a scenario in next year's draft. I don't want to get like too ahead of yourself, but this year's quarterback class is really good. This year's quarterback class has a handful of guys that you would be very comfortable investing in, and next year's class might, but even those guys who we talked about in, in next year's class, you know, like Quinn Ewers or Shadur Sanders or Carson Beck, you know, like those, those players would all have been outside of the big four, if you will, in this class. So if you're the Giants, you don't want to sit here in a situation where you you do a little bit of look ahead. You do a little bit of future scouting and you get into this situation where you sit here with the number six overall pick. You're close. You're within striking distance. Maybe you don't even have to move up to get a quarterback in this draft. Maybe you can get one of these big four that'll fall to you. But even if it took a little bit of a trade up to number four with Arizona to go get whoever that fourth best quarterback that maybe you love would be, I think that they're going to be desperate to do it. Especially when you look at the rest of the moves that they have made this offseason. Yes, I guess you could tell yourself, hey, they're doing all of these things for Daniel Jones or for the quarterbacks that they have on their roster. I think it's the opposite. I, I think that what they have done, the free agents that they brought along the offensive line, the changes that they've made to the defense, bringing in Brian Burns, shoring up that side of the ball, having a really great defensive line now, it's basically shaping up for them to get as aggressive as they might want to be to go get a quarterback. You could say the same thing about wide receiver. And look, I can't push that far back on you, right? I mean, you look at this wide receiver room, they're still in need for a wide receiver one. They could certainly pick one at the top of the draft. But to me, everything they did in, in, in free agency signaled them giving themselves the flexibility to go up and get a quarterback if, if the situation presented itself, if, it, if the price wasn't exorbitantly high, if you will. So that's that's what I come down to when I look at this giant situation is I don't think they're happy with the quarterback situation the way that it is. And I think that they would be desperate to move up because of what they have already done in free agency, the situation that Joe Shane and Brian Dable are currently in where they got to win this year. This team's got this team's got to look good this year, right? I mean, like you've very clearly got to be going in the right direction. And if another year goes by and Jones is the same guy that he has 
sort of always been to his career at this point. I don't know if that's good enough for Brian Dable to keep his job. Like a lot of things would still have to go well throughout the rest of the roster. I think Shane's got a little bit longer of a leash at this point, but that's to me why I think these guys are desperate because if you have the ability and look, I know I'm kind of rambling now, but I think about this situation a lot. If, if you're in this situation with New York where you can draft a young future franchise quarterback that you love, that extends your timeline if you're a regime. That extends Shane's timeline and extends extends uh, Dayball's timeline, and it allows them to actually groom this guy to get better instead of you know, making this debate. Okay, well, do we do you know do we do we sign this guy that we didn't draft? You know, we both kind of came in and he was already here on the roster. And to me, I just I think they're going to be desperate to get their guy that they can believe in that they could say yes. We picked this player. We brought this guy in. We're going to develop him. That's all ultimately why I use the word desperate for the Giants because I think there's a lot of things that go into that situation. While you look at the rest of the division, Cowboys are good. Eagles are good. Commanders have the number two overall pick. A lot of new hope in that franchise. A lot of draft picks coming up this year to really turn that around. So they've got to get their foot on the gas at some point or they might be left in the rearview mirror. Yeah, as you were talking about that, you know, I was thinking about what I have said at Big Blue View in my writing and, and here on the show. What I have said is the timing is right. The placement is right. The opportunity is right for them to go get a quarterback because of Jones having one year left on his one year of guaranteed money left. Right. The injury history, the place where they are in the draft, the number of quarterbacks who are available, even if you wanted to go back and and talk about you know Michael Penix and Bo Nix beyond the big four um it just feels like it just feels like now is the right time especially since you can make the argument that whoever that guy is he doesn't have to play week one because you're paying Daniel Jones anyway so you know so so go through as much of the year as you can with Jones until you feel like the, the whoever you draft is, is absolutely ready. So that's what I've said is that just that, just that the timing feels right to go get a quarterback. Yeah. And I would agree with you. I think for all of those reasons, it, it makes a ton of sense. And again, I, I, I personally think their free agency moves pointed to that pointed to giving themselves the flexibility to go up and make that move. And you know, you never want a situation like, you know, even the Bears at number one overall, if they didn't have to play Caleb Williams week one, I don't know if they would want to. Now, their situation's, I guess, a little bit different. They're kind of starving for some top quarterback play, so maybe they would have anyways. But when you get these younger guys, you would love to draft them to situations where they don't have to play immediately, right? You would love to draft them to situations where they could sit back and learn. And I look at Minnesota with what they have with Sam Darnold. I look at the Giants and what they have with Daniel Jones, like, those are two areas and those are two landing spots for these quarterbacks that I love. And, you know, if you're getting drafted to Chicago or Washington or New England, you know, it's not going to be that way. It's going to be, you got to start right away. And some of these quarterbacks in this draft class, I'm more comfortable than others doing that. But regardless of which quarterback it is, having that flexibility for New York, I think is what they have been setting up to do all along. I really do. It's interesting. I have to ask you about J.J. McCarthy. And there are still Giants fans, listeners to my show, readers of my website who who can't understand how J.J. McCarthy went from this second round pick in the eyes of the media three months ago to this guy mm -hmm. who's going to go most likely in the top 10, he might go in the top four. He might go number two, which I I, I doubt. But when I look at it, and, you know, I think the NFL has a lot more information. They see things a lot differently. They care about a lot more things than the YouTube highlights that people see or don't see. Um, and the one thing that I wanted to ask you as you were talking about next year's draft class, what I've said is, look, McCarthy might be QB4 in this class. His ceiling might be whatever you think it is, although I think it's higher than some people because he's 21 years old. Mm -hmm. but. If the Giants think he's QB1 in next year's class, then what difference does it make if he's QB4 in this one? 
Um, and it sounds to me like you think he might be QB one if he was in next year's class. Yeah, I think that there's a chance that, that could be right. I mean, when you look at McCarthy, I think the conversation with him starts with growth. And look, we do a series on our NFL draft show, summer scouting. I know not reinventing the wheel there, but we take a look at the guys in the summer for the upcoming draft class and what we would like to see from them um, during what could be their last year of college football. J.J. McCarthy was getting a decent amount of hype, right? Former five-star quarterback, Michigan quarterback, you know, let him do a near-perfect season last year, the college football playoff, and last year, I say 2022. And I remember watching his 2022 tape during the summer, this past summer. And I was like, cool, this guy's far away. Like, man, if you just took the 2022 tape, he is far away. I mean, really did not have a good feel for pressure in the pocket, was really late to throws. They did not ask him to do much at all. You know, sometimes he'd be, he'd be a little bit of a backyard playmaker for you. But, man, when it came to operating that offense and really going through the offense and being somebody who truly elevated it and created it and was a major focal point of it individually, I mean, he just he was not that in 2022. 2023, all that stuff got better. All of it got better. He was much better under pressure. He had a much better feel for the pocket when pressure was coming around him. Not necessarily like, oh, I have to look at where the pressure is coming from. Like he could feel it behind him. He knew how to step up. He, he was not afraid of making some of those big throws. In fact, I think he was the best third and long quarterback in this draft class over the last year. He was able to get through his progressions quicker. He's got some really nice accuracy. He's not afraid to throw over the middle of the field. He certainly showed that. So that fearless mentality stepped up for him. Sure, Michigan wasn't asking him to pass for 300 yards every single game, but there were a handful of fearless, hey, you got to step up and be our quarterback type of moments, and he was able to step up and be big in them. And I think those get lost beyond some of the non-stat stuff in games is maybe the way to say it. And look, I, I think the debate between like, okay, QB4 this year, QB1 next year, like, yeah, you definitely think about those things. But at the end of the day, I gave J.J. McCarthy a late first, early second round grade. I have the same grade on Jaden Daniels. Would I love for these guys to get picked somewhere in the 20s or maybe even in the beginning part of the second round to go to a great situation, not have a ton of pressure, be able to kind of acclimate to NFL life and get better and have that really high ceiling still? Sure, I would. But when fans go, how did we get from McCarthy being a second round pick to a top five overall pick when there's been no football played over the last two to three months? Well, it's a two-part answer. One, over this time period since January, we're not necessarily learning anything new about the players themselves, but we are learning more about what teams think of the players. So when you see these mock drafts, they're a reflection of what we believe the league thinks of these guys. So very clearly, there are a lot of teams in the league who are big on J.J. McCarthy. And the other part of it is, and this is the part of how you get these guys vaulted up so high, the position means everything in the world. I mean, we're learning from NFL. It, it's very easy for me to sit here in, uh, in, in my desk chair and say, yeah, I wouldn't take J.J. McCarthy till like the end of the first round. These, Whereas I'm just sitting here in front of a computer chair. These guys are running multi-billion dollar franchises. Where if you hit it quarterback, you got a mate. I mean, you're you're making record profits every single year. You're winning games. You're selling out stadiums. You got franchise icons. You're talked about all over the country and all over the sport and all over the world. Like th that, that part genuinely matters. So when you look at McCarthy and when you say to yourself, okay, He's not there yet, but if your scouting staff and your, your your coaching staff and your front office believes that he could get there, if he believes that he has a Super Bowl type of a ceiling, well, that's how we get from back end of the first round, early part of the second round, because we're just watching him based off the tape that kind of he has this past year, projecting that he'll get better. But these guys are projecting, okay, but what could they mean as the face of a franchise? And that's what we say when we say a, you are paying a quarterback tax to draft one in the top 10 of the first first round, not because this guy is there yet. If he was there yet, he'd be number one overall, right, for the talent that we say that J.J. McCarthy has. It's because he's not there yet that we have this debate a little bit further down in the order, but that ceiling doesn't go away. 
And I think that's what fans need to remember with McCarthy. It's not exactly about what you see now. It's about what you could become and the fact that you play the position that if you hit at that position, everything else gets better. Everything else opens up for you. And uh, yeah, like I said, it's multi-billion dollar uh, franchises that uh, it could mean the world for him in terms of a Super Bowl. As you were talking about that, I was thinking about two former New York Giants general managers who are perfect examples of getting the quarterback right and then you know everything more or less falling into place. George Young took Phil Simms way back in the day when nobody had even heard of Phil Simms. That worked out pretty well for 15 or 16 years. Ernie Accorsi made the big trade to get Eli Manning and that worked out pretty well for 15 or 16 years as well. Um, and I think I think you're right. I think what it is, is you take the swing because we see it over and over and over. Maybe that guy is the 25th most talented player on the draft, in the draft. But quarterback is so important. In this day and age, you have to have somebody who on any given day can compete against Patrick Mahomes or Joe Burrow or Josh Allen or these top, you have to have that guy to be a consistently good football team and have a chance. So it's, it's an interesting swing and, and talking about that and talking about taking the swing. Um, the guy who is the, the quote unquote home run swing, he's the grand slam swing in the top of this draft class. That guy's Drake may. And, Use the baseball analogy. I mean, he he might turn into Dave Kingman. <laughs> he might turn into Aaron Judge. But do you see him that way as sort of like the the huge, you know, he could be fantastic for you and he could get you fired kind of swing? I, I'm much more towards the former than the latter. I mean, I have Jay Drake May as QB2 in this class, and I've had May QB2 basically wire to wire. I mean, even through the last three or four months, as Jaden Daniels kind of hype has risen, and, and with J.J. McCarthy as well, like Drake May is my QB2. I mean, to me, he's got the best arm talent in this class outside of Caleb Williams, honestly. Now, yeah, you, people bring up, oh, you know, like Joe Milton, better arm talent. Okay, well, I'm, I, you got to – when you talk about arm talent, it's not just about how hard you can throw the ball. You, like, you also got to be accurate with it. And there are some incredible throws that I see from Drake May. I mean, that thing could come off of his wrist like a rocket. You know, he can hit – I think when you say all the throws, I think there's more that goes into that than just being able to, you know – lean back and, and fire a ball 70 yards down the field. That phrase is so much deeper than I think a lot of people who use it realize it's it, making every throw in the NFL is about, okay, can you, you know, scramble to your right and make an off platform sidearm throw with good accuracy to the player that's coming across the line uh, on a sail route towards the sideline. Yes, he can do that. It's, it's okay. The they're, they're playing spot zone coverage and they're dropping back, but you've got a, you've got an opportunity to fire that ball right in between these linebackers before you get to the safeties about 15 yards down the middle of the field. Can you do that? Do you have the, the mental confidence to do that? Yes. I think that Drake may absolutely does that. Can you put touch under passes for a corner route heading to the sideline from the slot? Yes, he can do that. I've seen that. So Though that's what I talk about when I talk about overall arm town and making all the throws. And that's why I believe that Drake May is that home run type of a player. Now, there are frustrating accuracy issues, especially from this past year. And I think it's because there are times when he gets really happy feet in the pocket. You know, he's just like, he's always bouncing. He's always like, and look, being light on your feet is a good thing. But there are times when, you know, his feet are just kind of chopping and his feet are frenetic and they're not really in rhythm married up with when he's going to throw the football. And so, you know, you'll have him be light on his feet and then he goes, oh, okay, well, I'm supposed to throw now. And it, his feet aren't set. They're not pointed in the right direction. And then you see some frustrating accuracy issues. But like, that stuff's correctable, right? I mean, like, I, I think I think it's crazy the way that we're talking about Drake May from a mainstream media standpoint, instead of like how we're talking about like McCarthy, right? McCarthy is what? He's this potential. It's just, oh yeah, but he'll get better. Like think about all the ways that he'll get better. He'll, he'll, he'll improve. He'll become that 300 yard quarterback. You know, he'll become the, Drake May's already been those things and his deficiencies are absolutely coachable, but he doesn't 
seem to get that same grace everywhere that it feels like JJ McCarthy does. And, you know, I don't want to get carried away with a game of telephone and, and, you know, the, the, the media who maybe you're just hearing kind of one side of the story and it gets amplified because insiders will get that information and they'll kind of put it out there. And then we say to ourselves, Oh, the whole league believes this. Well, maybe not. Maybe it's just a handful of coaches or GMs and we kind of take it like wildfire. But to me, I just, if anybody looking at JJ McCarthy, If you want to say to yourself, man, such great potential, like look what he could become if he gets a little bit better, if he gets a little bit more confident, if he sees things a little bit more, like he could be a do-it-all quarterback for you. If you want to say that, I would say, okay, like I I, I see you there. I won't push back too far on you because I think that is that that is within his wheelhouse. But then you can't turn around and go, oh man, yeah, I mean, Drake May, the footwork's a mess. I mean, it's just, yeah, he's just such this big risk because- Drake May is also a true junior coming out of college. Like he started as a true sophomore. Like he, he, he's not that old. I think he's going to be like 22 when he gets into the league. So it's just so weird how we're kind of talking about him in a different light than these other quarterbacks. So I don't think the floor is as low as it seems like it is for maybe other people in the league. I just think his ceiling is, is, is extremely high in that of a franchise caliber type of a player who, when you need quarterbacks to step up in big moments, he gives you, the whole talent spectrum to be able to do so, whatever that looks like at that given play when you really need it from them. And those quarterbacks, I just I just can't say no to. Last thing for you quickly, I know you've got to run um, a May McCarthy thing, and, and you can even give me a yes or no answer here on this. I think with the parallels from Drake May to Josh Allen and all of that with Brian Dable being the Giants coach, I think – The Giants would take either guy, May or McCarthy, given the opportunity. But I think given a choice between the two, they would be more aggressive to go up and get McCarthy, take that home run swing just because you've already seen some of it, especially in 2022. And I think the ceiling's higher. So just just your your take on that. Yeah, and... And I I don't disagree with you. You know, as as a as a individual scout, I would say that I disagree with you because I have May ranked significantly higher on my just overall big board than I do McCarthy. But I would get it for the Giants specifically because again, the situation that you have, you can allow him ample time to kind of learn and get his feet wet and get acclimated to NFL life and the NFL game and. Also, selfishly for the guys who might be drafting them, you know, I, I don't think this is how they operate, but you can sell a longer term vision of JJ McCarthy, right? Like you can sell a longer term, like, okay, well, the first year it's all developing. And then the second year, we're really trying to figure out. So you basically, if they draft McCarthy outside of a catastrophic season, Shane and Dable basically bought themselves two more years. It's, it's, it because look, when we talk about, especially head coaches, right? I think we talk about, okay, they've got three or four years to build a winner. That is true, but the reality is, the statement is actually, you have three to four years to get a quarterback. That's what it is. Because if you don't get one, you're going to be gone for one way or the other, because the team is going to falter in a certain way where the, somebody's going to be able to point to you and be like, see, like, oh, well, this isn't going crazy. This isn't going. And if you hit a quarterback, sometimes it just doesn't matter. Like sometimes if you hit a quarterback, you can have plenty of time to fix the rest of the roster. Cause that's what matters most. So, you know, if, if they prefer McCarthy again, that's not how I see it, but for the giants specifically, it is a landing spot that I like for McCarthy because of what you brought up. It is the uh, ideal timeline that you could have to allow him to grow. You could groom him to be the guy who is even better than the player who was a national champion and only lost one game as a starter at Michigan, right? I think that he, you can groom him to be even better than that, even more of a gunslinger and all that kinds of stuff. So um, I get it. I, again, not how I see it, but I would understand if they were to present that and say, we believe in this guy's ceiling more. I could say, okay, I could see the allurement of it and I could know why you're going for it. All right. Hey, Trevor, appreciate the time. Like I said, I know you have to run. 
lots of people want your time and, and your insight these days. So I, I know you've got someplace else to be. So Giants fans, uh, thank you as always for listening. Please stay safe out there. Take care of each other and we'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.